you broke it down in the innovation stack form. Um, are we recording? Because actually, I like this. This. So yeah. so so. By the way, the whole innovation stack thing ch changed my perspective on business. I'm, wow! I'm, it, it, really? It, yeah. The, the the way you described Square and then Square's innovation stack, then IKEA, then Bank of America, and Southwest. I never thought about things that when you're really innovating, there's you're you're doing something new, which means, oh, just because we're doing this, so we have to do this next thing. Like yeah. like your whole thing with, oh, we're gonna make something for the the bottom third of businesses to accept credit cards. So that means we have to make it as easy as possible and cheap as possible to sign up. So that means we have to make hardware as easy as, as cheap as possible, but nice design. So that means we have to make all yeah. the software as easy to, to sign up. That means we have to do, and, and on, on, you had 14 things. And, yeah. then, and then the way, what was, what was genius was the way you describe how you beat Amazon is that each part of that innovation stack there's only a certain probability of success, even yep. if you're Amazon or if you're you or whoever. And so it makes sense that the bigger the innovation stack is, the, the number of so we have tos after that first innovation, the odds of success of anybody competing you get, get drop enormously. Yes, yes. And that was the thing that uh, ultimately gave me the, the, the justification because I was, I was looking for an explanation and I could not understand how Square survived an attack by Amazon because nobody had done so. Right. So, so, so just to summarize, yeah. Square is the way that basically a quarter of all American business now accept <laughs> credit cards. And this is just in the past 10 years, nine years, whatever it is. Since I don't know, I don't know the day you launched, but how long has it been? Uh, we launched in 2010. Yeah. So, so 10 years and a quarter of U.S. businesses now accept credit cards through Square. It's that thing, you know, that little thing next to attached to your iPhone or whatever, and you swipe your card through and now everybody can accept a credit card. Yep. Yep. Get paid. And by the way, you were kind of batshit crazy for launching this business. It was insane. <laughs> like if you would try to justify what we were doing, it would never work. Like nobody would have backed us. Because I remember thinking, I remember thinking like when e-commerce was first becoming a thing, like let's say in the 90s, oh, it was really hard for a business to set up an e-commerce. So you had to get these people to agree to accept your credit card, these banks to process the credit cards. And I was thinking, well, why doesn't one person, uh, everybody was thinking, why doesn't one person just, uh, do it once for a bunch of businesses, but no, it was illegal or against the regulations yes. it, for Mastercard they had a rule Visa. specifically prohibiting that. Yeah, that, so you said, yeah. you know what? Every rule and law prevents <laughs> me from succeeding, but I'm gonna just do it anyway, and let's just see what happens. Yeah. What? How? Why did they? Why did you? And you describe in the book, but I still don't understand. Why didn't you think in the very beginning this was gonna be a massive stumbling block? Well, we discovered the stumbling blocks as we stumbled along. You know, it's so the first thing we did was discovered that uh, we were breaking a bunch of laws, like the very first day. Um, and we looked at the laws and we looked at the rules and we said, oh, well, some of these we think we can comply with later. And then it was about a week later, I ran across the specific prohib prohibitions that Visa and MasterCard had against what Square was doing. Which is equivalent to law. Yeah, it was, it was law. I mean, because you had to connect to them. It was actually, it was actually worse than law because like at least law, you can like buy off some legislator or lobbyist or something. Like you, we you all can, do. You can kind of, you can kind of do that, right? You can, you can think of having the law change, but like Visa does not make eye contact with your little startup, you know? And we were uh, just totally dependent on them changing the rules. And fortunately they did. But wait, wait, wait. Yeah. That was one week later you realized that. There's, I think there's a, an important subtlety here, which is that every 99.999% .99 of entrepreneurs would say, okay, it's against Visa's rules. Okay, what's another idea? Let's anybody else have any other ideas for a business? Yeah, well, Jack and I aren't like that. I mean, we were sort of excited about it um, because what we were doing was not trying to you know, comply with Visa or MasterCard. We were trying to build something for small merchants. And so we had this problem that people like me, like small business couldn't take credit cards. And so I really wanted to solve that problem because it was a personal problem. I cared about it. I had friends who had suffered because they couldn't do it. Um, and so you don't quit easily. And, you know, we were uh, headstrong enough to think that we could get MasterCard and Visa to change their rules. And the way we approached it was we tried to get a meeting with them. Uh, that took over a year uh, to get the right meeting. And by that year, we had already built it. And we went into a meeting, which I, I you know, I tell the story in the book, but uh, this terrifying meeting where uh, uh, 
Ed McLaughlin and his, his team at MasterCard basically had the fate of our company in their hands. Like, that was that. Like, if he'd said no, we were dead. And he said yes. Like, if he said no, was there any way around it? Like, could you have basically set up a new corporate ID for each business that signed up? Or was there some workaround? I don't know. I, there might have been. You know, it, like, we, would we have folded the tents if they'd said no? Probably not. Um, but, you know, Visa and MasterCard want to keep you out of their system. They will keep you out of their system. What if they say no now? What if they say, you know what, we're kind of tired of you? Like, are you dependent on them now? Well, I think it's a mutual dependency. I mean, we're bringing a ton of business to them. And we are very good actors. And we are, I mean, the fraud on our system is, is infinitesimal. Um, we're really good for them. So they could, and that would suck. Um, and I think Square would still survive. But I don't think they would do that because we're a huge help to those networks. We're bringing a tremendous amount of volume and transparency. And we've actually increased the market that they serve. So let's, let's describe this as kind of like a ready, fire, aim kind of strategy. Like you, you, you got your whole business ready. Mm -hmm. you, you, normally people would aim like, okay, we're going to um, find all the, you know, we're going to figure out what all the stumbling blocks are, and then we're going to fire. We're going to, we're going to solve them, get customers and so on. You sort of basically immediately, you started the whole business knowing that there's this huge stumbling block and, and you had no idea if, if they were going to allow you to stay in business. And I think, I think a lot of, I, again, I think a lot of people wouldn't do that. I think I, I, I know I wouldn't have done it. Because I've many times just given up. Oh, you can't do this. Okay, no problem. Next idea. But again, I I I admire the psychology that uh, is required to to do that. Yeah. So so it's the aim part that moves, right? It's the ready, ready fire aim. If you want to take aim first, you have to have something to aim at, which means you know what you're doing. So if you're doing a business that has been done before. So we're going to open up a coffee shop. Well, then we know how to open up coffee shops in this world. It has, been, it has been done before. As a matter of fact, there's a convention that'll teach you how to do this. There are consultants that'll teach you how to do this. Um, and that can be aimed at. We can say, I'm going to have a coffee shop that's like this, and you can do that. Well, what if you are going to open up uh, like a marijuana dispensary, which hasn't really been done that much? There have been a few, but like somebody did the first one. Well, that's really weird because the government has kind of got this crazy status where part of it's legal and part of it's not legal. And, you know, it's, it's legal on the state level. It's illegal on the uh, federal level. And, and so you don't get to sit there and have this known model that works. You have to figure all sorts of stuff out. And these guys are not like moving bags of cash around now because they can't figure out how to connect to the banking system because, well, it's illegal at the federal level. So the banks won't touch them. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, so it's, a, it's a fundamentally different thing if you have the ability to aim, please aim. You know, as a parent of a boy, please aim, you know? But uh, the issue is if you don't have something to aim at, what do you do? Do you quit then? And my reason for writing this book was basically to say to the people, look, sometimes it's completely appropriate to not have a target because what you're doing is new. If you're doing something that's new, hasn't been done before, what do you aim at? So, and when you, when you do something that's new too, this is also the opportunity for the biggest gains because you, yeah. had, you had this audience of basically every business owner that for whatever reason wasn't accepting credit cards. They weren't either approved through the system or they couldn't get Visa to like them yep. or whatever it is. And so you were making this possible. Like I said, now, it, now it's 25% of all U.S. businesses ex can accept credit cards because of Square. But, uh, uh, you know, I think that was the other thing, you know, so we'll, we'll talk about the, the book's called the innovation stack, which is sort of your main, um, point about entrepreneurship in the book. But there's another point that I think is really interesting, not just for business, but for art, for all creativity, which is what's an, a huge audience. And it's usually kind of the cheaper audience. What's a huge audience that's being either underserved or not served, uh, by a market right now. And, you know, Square's a great example. Uh, 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 you, you have the example of Southwest, which is like, you know, how can we get cheap airfares for, when there's all these expensive airlines around? And, and you give a bunch of other examples in the book. And I think 
this is really important. What, what can you do for a huge market that's not being served? And e even like, uh, you know, I don't know, setting up a podcast, we have a bunch of nice cameras, equipment, people, you know, there's, there's some people who have things to say who don't have all these resources yeah, to start yeah. a podcast. So there, there's lots of ways to look at like what these, these, these huge underserved markets are like invisible. So I think every market is underserved at the bottom. Like if you look at almost any market, you will see that it stops at some point. And below that threshold is the rest of the market. Okay, so take cars, right? And what's a new car cost? I don't know. The, probably the cheapest new car you can get these days, about 15 grand. Um, and if you want to sell a car for under $15,000, uh, none of the major car companies is going to match that. They will, they will quit at 15 or whatever, wherever the bottom part of the market is. So what if we could build a car and sell it for 2000 bucks and give transportation to people who couldn't afford a new car? Well, there'd be a pretty big market for that. You know, same thing with furniture. I mean, uh, so I profile Ikea in the book. And if you think about new furniture and what that costs and, and how difficult it is for families to afford sort of nice things and uh, what they did at Ikea, you know, Comprod built this system that was allowed that allowed people to have new furniture for the first time in their lives. Um, and they had, so, so this pattern, it's really interesting, James, because it repeats throughout every industry that I looked at. And you see these companies that pick a target that's outside of the market. It's, and it's usually below the existing market. It's cheaper, it's more accessible. And then they figure out some crazy way to build that product. And then they've got this massive market to themselves. And the companies who run the game right can be dominant in that field as long as they choose. They can, they can just be the bank for the world or be the bus for the world or whatever. Yeah, so I wonder what, well, like right now, if you were brainstorming, what would be another market? So cars is a good one. I like that one. Oh, cars is a good one. Healthcare is a good one. I mean, uh, uh, anything. I mean, uh, there's, uh, there's opportunity literally in every market. If I, if I had to pick one right now, um, to do, uh, I think we, I think we have urban transportation issues. I think the question of how you get around a city is, uh, is still sort of a, a mess. Um, what about like education? So you look at like tuitions are, are outrageous right now, but there is, there is online education that's cheap and, and probably just as good as so-called accredited education. But there's like, it's just like, uh, it's like a brand thing or a status thing. Oh, did you go to an accredited school or did you just learn how to program a computer at an online school? So there's kind of a status thing. Yeah. So the, uh, uh, so I've actually done that, uh, launch code, which is a nonprofit that I started, uh, gives free classes in computer science. Um, and, uh, we teach you how to program for free and then we get you a job. And, uh, that free model is really accessible. So instead of having to spend 10,000 bucks for a boot camp, or, you know, way more than that for a, you know, accredited, you know, four-year college, uh, you can go sc study computer science, um, at least the part you need to get a programming job uh, for free at Launch Code. So, uh, so what's keeping so kids from like just taking, oh, I'm gonna, I'll, I, I want to major in computer science, I might as well do Launch Code for free rather than spending 67000 a year at uh, the local state college or whatever. Well, we're only in five cities right now, but uh, they can take the classes online at launchcode.org for free. Um, and some do, like many, many do. Like one of the, one of the toughest conversations I had was this 15-year-old kid who uh, went through our program and got his job. And I felt bad because I was like, well, this kid's not going to go to college. I had to talk to his mother. I was like, are you okay with us placing your son who's not able to drive yet into a full-time job? <laughs> And she was like, yeah, <laughs> go, go, go earn your keep kid. <laughs> so, I mean, which is a rational response. So yeah. most of society is not rational right now with this. Well, you know, there's you know, rationality comes in waves, right? <laughs> um, so there's a, uh, uh, there's a real opportunity there, uh, in education and, and not just for the young, like we see people at launch code, uh, the oldest guy we've placed, uh, was 74 hmm. free education gets a coding job at 74 years old. And he's working for MasterCard. Gets hired. Oh, so now if, if MasterCard ever screws with you, you've got your spy in there. <laughs> got, got, got 21 launch coders inside. He's right in the database. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, They're infected. So, so actually, okay, <laughs> let's talk about launch code for a second. So the, the idea of this innovation stack is that when you're doing something new, there's always going to be something unexpected that happens that uh, either expected or unexpected, but you still have to do something else. Like you're going to make this accessible to 
You're going to make credit card processing accessible to every business. So you have to get approval from Visa. You're going to sell to millions of people. So you have to have a uh, low customer service costs and, and on and on and on. Yep. That's your innovation stack is that all these things kind of ripple out of that first initial innovation. So like with launch code, what, uh, which you don't really describe in the book, uh, what, what would you say is the parts of the innovation stack that you've had to deal with? So the big thing that launch code was, I looked at the, uh, so I looked at the problem, which is we have all these talented people who could be great programmers. And we all have these companies that definitely need programming talent. I mean, the, the shortage of programmers grows larger every single year. And then I asked myself the question, why? And the answer was education in its current form doesn't work for some reason in this niche. So take welding. Like if we need welders, what you do is you open up a welding school and then you train welders. So then we have enough welders and the problem goes away. But for some reason that doesn't work with programming. And I was like, why doesn't it work? So I looked at what it, what the difference is between a welder and a programmer and a welder who's terrible. So let's say you're a bad welder. Okay. You can come in and screw up every one of your welds and they all fall apart, but you can't be such a bad welder that you make my welds fall apart. Hmm. But if you're a bad coder and you write a query and it corrupts a database, you can literally trash the work of everybody. So rational companies hire programmers with experience because they make fewer errors. So if you're a IT manager, you say, wait, I don't want somebody screwing up because he doesn't know what he's doing. So I'm only going to hire people with two years experience. And as a result, the people who want to get these jobs can't get jobs because they don't have two years experience. So the irony of traditional education is that in programming, it just doesn't work because you can't get the jobs. So what we did at Launch Code was I said, okay, if, it, if traditional education isn't working, let's do it backwards. So the great experiment with Launch Code was we said, okay, let's do no training at all. Let's just find people who know how to program and figure out a way to get them placed at companies. And we figured out a way to do this. Um, and once we figured out how to get a new person placed at a company who said, we're never going to hire a new person, and we did it through pair programming. So we, basically, we would put this person with an experienced person, and we would place them both. So that worked. And then um, we quickly created another problem, which was, oh, well, now we've figured out a way to place people who don't have traditional credentials. Now we need a lot of people who are trained. So now we bring in the education, but new problem. I can't afford to give four-year education at 50,000 bucks a whack to uh, an infinite number of people. I have to figure out a way to get that price down to almost zero. So solution. Harvard's got an online education program that they make available for free. It's called CS50. It's great curriculum. And it wasn't designed to get you a job. But hey, you know, if you can finish this class from Harvard, which is free, you're good enough for us to get you a job. So we started teaching that. But then we had problems with the classes not being, you know, tailored and the students couldn't get through it. So we had a graduation rate of 1%. So we had to get that rate up. So we, you know, innovation, 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 did three other things differently, got our graduation rate up to 50%. So, you know, in each case, we solved a problem. We had a new problem. We looked for that problem, see if anyone else had solved that. In many cases, nobody had had that new weird problem before. So then we had to invent a solution to that. So Launch Code has, you know, seven or eight things that it does in its innovation stack. And it allows us to now train people for free and get them real jobs. And the companies love it. But you, you can't start out with this guarantee of success. Oh, if I only have to do these seven things, I know I'll succeed. Like maybe the answer is you got to do 75 things. And you're right, just, I think your whole you, point you is don't that you don't know. You don't know. Because it's sort of like, I sort of feel this way about taking even a, a, a 30,000 look down people who do like, Oh, here's my five-year goals. Like there's all these books, do your three-year goals, your five-year goals. The whole concept is after six months, you've, you're a different person. You've learned while pursuing your five-year goals, now your goals might change. Like, I kind of think, you know, if you had specific goals on any of these things, you wouldn't know what, you know, you kind of just have to focus on today. What do I need to do to move forward? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've tried setting those goals and I just get depressed. I mean, I just, because <laughs> I fail. You know, something changes or I'm going to be really good about, I'm going to do more sit-ups and, you know, uh, no, I'm not. You know? <laughs> we have a trainer at the gym and we don't go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, uh, I, I, I 
deep respect for people who could set long-term goals and work towards them in an organized way. Um, and that is a great skill set. Um, if you have it, cherish it. But I'm also saying that there is a different skill set that is really underappreciated, and that is the person who can act without certainty. Hmm. They can sit there and look at a problem that hasn't been solved and say, I don't know if this can be solved, but I'm going to try, and I'm going to keep trying. And at some point, everyone's going to give up. But sometimes they end up figuring it out. And usually, figuring it out is not one thing. It's 20 things or 12 things. I put 14 things in per square. You know, Southwest Airlines, we probably stopped at 20 when I was talking to Herb Keller. He was telling me all the stuff that Southwest did differently. And um, once you figure that out, you then have this amazing tool to enrich millions of people's lives. You, you, you can provide them with a, with, a, with a service that they didn't have before. And, you know, Herb Keller, who was telling me these stories about how families, you know, who had, you know, loved ones who needed to get cancer uh, uh, treatment at MD Anderson would, you know, fly them on Southwest. How, you know, kids were visiting their grandparents because they could now afford to do it. Um, how the cities would grow because they'd have air service. You know, these are tremendously empowering things. Like if you, if you have the ability to do something like that, I want you to do it. And the reason I wrote the book is because I've met so many people who are, I think, qualified to do it. I think, I think they have the potential to do it. But then I talk to them and they say, well, I could never do that. I don't, I don't, I'm not qualified. And, and look, what I'm saying in the innovation stack, and here, listen to this. And you don't even have to buy the book if you, hear, if you get this right. If you're doing something new, you by definition are not qualified. Nobody is qualified to do something new. If it's been done before, then yeah, we probably have a checklist of stuff you ought to learn how to do. But if it's new, if it truly hasn't been done before, we are all starting at zero. And don't disqualify yourself just because you feel unqualified. Now, it, and it doesn't apply to everything. So I was uh, uh, you know, flying out here with a friend, and he's a pilot. And if you want to get in a plane right now and fly around, you better get trained. You better get certified. You get a you know, you get your medical, you're going to do all sorts of stuff before you are qualified to take off and fly an airplane on your own. But what if we just invented the airplane? Like, what if you and I just went and built the first right flyer? And you say, well, I'm going to fly it. Well, James, you're not qualified to fly this airplane, but you're as qualified as any other human. And one of the Wright brothers did die while flying one of the first planes, so. Yeah, but not on the first flight. <laughs> not on the first flight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, airplanes were really dangerous. And yes, this stuff does go wrong a lot. But, you know, so, so you know, another thing, and, and you, you've kind of just alluded to it, is that you see a lot of people who are qualified, but they kind of run into this psychological block. They think they're not qualified to, to do something really innovative. And that's your reason for writing this book is to show them how with this kind of methodology and this way of thinking, they could be qualified. And you have direct experience with this. You were working with the young Jack Dorsey when he was 15 years old before he created the product that we all know and love as Twitter. And then you were his co-founder on Square where, you know, he went on to build and, and you built a, a multi-billion dollar company. What did you see in him at the age of 15 that you were like, oh my gosh, this, this guy's got something. Jack was incredibly competent at everything he did. So he showed up, he was 15 years old. Um, we pulled an all-nighter with him the first night that he worked with us. Um, he was a great team member, uh, very quiet, uh, didn't brag, but his work was stellar. And I was not, I didn't have any preconceptions of who could do things. So I just kept giving him tasks. And he wasn't qualified to be a graphic designer, but he redesigned our company logos. And they were better than the logos that the professionals had designed. So we used his logos. And then you know, one day I asked him, Jack, do you like to program? And he's like, oh, I love to program. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have you do some programming. So he did some programming and his programming was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So we started using it as a, as a coder and, and pretty soon I was hiring people to work for Jack mm -hmm. when he was, you know, still coming to work on a bicycle. Yeah. And, and, and that was because what he was capable of doing, even at, you know, 15 and 16 was, uh, in my mind, fantastic work. So we just kept working together and, you know, we became friends and, uh, you know, 15 years later, we started Square. 
And what, what, what were you kind of doing in between? So you had your software company that you had, that Jack had worked at. What were you sort of doing with Presquare? Presquare, um, I had uh, started uh, a glass studio. So I was blowing glass a lot, uh, which is something I love to do. Um, I'd started uh, a roofing company, which was something that I thought I should do because there was an opportunity uh, to put roofs on. And on all the, all the um, housing projects in every city? or No, 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 no. I had some land in Florida, and there was a big hurricane. And uh, a guy called me up and said, uh, he said, hey, could we use your house, uh, which had been almost trashed, uh, to, uh, to put a roofing crew in there? And I, like an idiot, thought, oh, well, if he's going to make a lot of money you know, renting my house, I could make even more money putting on roofs. And so I started a roofing company and it was a disaster. Mm. It was horrible. Mm. Oh my God. Because you have to actually like climb on a roof and like put you, stuff there. Yeah. I, Cause you actually have to work uh, really dangerous situations. And I quit roofing when uh, one of my employees fell through a roof. He didn't fall off it. Like I can understand falling off a roof. Yeah. You get clumsy, but if you fall through it, like, what are you going to do? The, the floor gives out underneath you. And I thought, I do not want to be in this business. Uh, was so he okay? What he was okay. He was okay. He fell 20 feet on a concrete oh and somehow miraculously uh, survived. And if I can give a plug, it is to Shaquille O'Neal High Tops. He was wearing Shaquille's shoes. And that is the only thing that saved him. I don't know. Shaquille O'Neal, proud sponsor of the James Alvesher yeah. Show podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the read. <laughs> no, the kid survived. He was fine. No broken bones. Um, but so square was like this new adventure for you. Like you're going to, you guys were setting out to basically solve a problem for, I don't know, 40 million people. And it's a huge endeavor. So we were solving a problem for one person. We did not know that there were 40 million. We did not know the size of the universe because again, if you're doing something that has never been done before, you don't know what the market is. And we literally built the whole thing for about a year without ever showing it to more than a handful of people. So we had no idea that there were this many people out there. And again, uh, the, the, the rational sort of MBA thinking is, we'll do a market study. Like, I need to know that the product I'm building has a market. Well, guess what? If you're building a product that's never been built before, you can't do a market study. So we, yeah, I mean, yeah, we had millions of customers, but we didn't know that. And Jack and I, you know, we sort of released this thing and it's like, well, are we going to hear crickets chirping or... Is there going to be a flood of customers? Well, it turns out there was a flood of customers, but we had no way to prove that. And as a matter of fact, when we talked to a lot of the people from within the industry, they told us absolutely that we would fail. And I remember going out to dinner with uh, the CEO of a you know, pretty sizable payments company, and he told me I was an idiot. He's like, you're an idiot, and I can prove it because I'm a payments expert. And he then gave me all these reasons why I was an idiot. What was one of the reasons? Because it does seem like uh, if I have like some shirts on the street that I want to sell, oh, it'd be great to have a way to accept credit cards. Oh, he said, he said, look, you, first of all, you, you guys selling your shirts on the street, he's got no bank account. Uh, he's got no credit rating. Uh, if he uh, starts uh, doing fraudulent transactions, you can't sue him. You can't find him. He doesn't even have a mailing address. I mean, the guy's going to, you know, roll his stuff up in a, you know, in a backpack and, you know, run. Like, you can't trust these people. Um, he had so many reasons why Square would fail. And the only thing I could think of was, I can't argue with this guy because what I'm trying to build doesn't exist. And I can't, I can't argue with him because he's had, you know, 10 years experience in the payments industry and he's calling me an idiot and I have to kind of agree with him. I was like, well, like from where you sit, man, I probably look like an idiot because you see this market as ending right here. And the end point in our case was about a hundred thousand. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe a little less about $10,000 a year. Like if you sold less than $10,000 a year, by definition, you did not take credit cards. And really the number was like a hundred. If your business did less than a hundred thousand dollars worth of business, you didn't take credit cards. And his view of the market just stopped there. He thought the world ended. And um, my attitude was, at least I live outside that world that you, like I am a customer for this product that doesn't exist. And I have a friend, Bob, who would probably use it. And I know Sherry Mims, who's a flower vendor, would probably use it. And Andre, our flight instructor, who was one of the first Square users, would you? And, you know, I had, I had five people, <laughs> you know, but it turns out we had millions. And then, uh, uh, so, so what was the point where suddenly you realized, oh, my gosh, this is it. This is, this is over the hump. 
and I'm going to get rich off of this. I could tell you the moment I knew we were onto something. I was, I was riding in a taxi cab in New Orleans, and the cabbie was so proud of the fact that he could take a credit card payment. And he was saying, I was like, I can take a credit card payment. I can take a credit card payment. He's like, look, look at this thing I have. And he showed me the square. And, and I was in the back of the cab. And I was the guy that invented, I, I had literally made the thing in his hand. And, and I didn't fess up. <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed about this because I didn't tell him because I just wanted to hear his pitch. And he got it all wrong. Like he got, you know, the, the rates were wrong. Like how you signed up was wrong. But he got, he got a couple things wrong. He's like, he, he got a couple things right. He was like, he got the free part right. He got this free. Um, he's like, uh, takes credit cards, you know, uh, gives you money the next day. Uh, and then the rest of the stuff he got wrong. Um, but when I was pitched on my own product in the back of a cab, I thought, oh my God, this is going to happen. Because this guy has no reason to tell me this, except that he is so excited mm -hmm. about what he can now do. And I like, there are a lot of people like this. So, so it's interesting. Like you've, you can, you can really argue what you've done just now and you, and you successfully do in the book that this is a business that changed lives. Like you basically helped, you know, mom and pop shops or just mom shops all yeah. over the country, you know, expand their business by, you know, we've been moving towards like a cashless society. Now they can accept credit cards. Like, like, like huge businesses can they're just the same as huge business it puts them on the same level as these huge businesses that accept credit cards so you've really had an impact on society what do you think of when you hear like a congressperson say you know uh or anybody say i'm not picking in anybody in particular but but you hear someone say uh, uh, oh these you know rich people billionaires whatever they 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 take their money they don't earn their money and here you have you've created something that's really helped society well, I mean, uh, yeah, Squares helped a lot of people. I mean, look, I, I don't really judge how people make their money, um, but I will but say some people this. do right now. Yeah, okay, yeah, you, you can do that. Uh, that's, that's a bunch of politics. Um, what I care about is what do you do then? So what I care about more than um, how people make their money is what they're willing to do with it. So one of the things that I will, I will tell you uh, that I don't like is how money becomes conservative as it's passed along generation to generation. Mm. Okay, so if you have a ton of money and you give it to the kids, let's say you make a billion dollars. Okay. From um, this podcast. Yeah, from the podcast. It's a great mm -hmm. podcast. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to happen. Yeah. Okay, so you got a billion dollar podcast. Okay, so James got, you just made a billion dollars. Now that's your money. Okay, and let's say you want to do something crazy with it. You want to, you know, land a rocket standing up, okay? It's insane to try to land a rocket standing up. That's, that's, that's just nuts, right? Because rockets don't land that way. So you start building rockets, and they start falling over. But you're like, God damn it, it's my money. I'm going to, you know, it takes you eight times to stick the landing. You can do that because it's your money. You can be a total idiot and do crazy stuff with your money. Now, let's say you give it to James Jr., right? Well, he can't do that. Because he comes with that money comes a little bit of guilt, right? It comes with a little bit of responsibility. He can't blow it, then he's a loser. Like you can blow it because you made it. Mm. So what I worry about is that by passing money along uh, too much, we are taking the money away from people who can take risk and giving it to people who then who then get protective and nervous. Because look, if you didn't make it, um, you're going to be more conservative. And I think conservative behavior at least in the sense of, of you know, being risk averse is, is really sort of tragic because sometimes you need to do something that could lose money. And um, I, right, what, right now, one of the responsibilities I feel I personally have is I've, I've made a lot of money. I need to do some stupid stuff. So I just bought a building that was, you know, uh, it was, it, they were trying to sell it for five years. An old, it was an old newspaper building the newspaper couldn't afford to live to, to, to rent it anymore. Um, and, and it was, they couldn't get rid of it. So I, 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 I stupidly bought this building. Okay. Now I am stupidly spending like an obscene amount of money fixing this up and building the most beautiful offices in St. Louis, because I want square to have really cool offices because I think square having a great office in St. Louis is going to help my city. Okay. I will tell you on paper, that is a dumb deal. And I will tell you on your show, 
that if anyone wants to buy my economic interest in this building, I will sell it to you. Like if, if you think like this is a great deal that I'm getting, I was like, hey man, you can be my business partner. Whatever percentage of this thing you want, bring it, okay? But nobody will because when you see how much money I'm losing on this thing, you're gonna go, Jim's an idiot. But, but that's okay. I'm just blowing my own money. So I like this idea that people and, and, can- And by the way, blowing your own money means you know, contractors are being hired. Like the oh, money's yeah. getting distributed. There, there is actual redistribution of wealth. It, it is, he creates redistribution of wealth. Yeah. I mean, we're not throwing a button giant party here. I mean, like this is, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of drywall. Um, but, uh, you know, the point is it's, it's very empowering if you are successful to then have the ability to take a big bet. And we see this in Silicon Valley. I mean, there are all sorts of crazy things getting funded. And we like to make fun of them because I'm like, wow, really? You're mining asteroids? Uh, okay, how's that going to work? You know? But, I mean, I literally had to keep a straight face at a party with a guy who was mining asteroids. Is that Naveen Jain? I think he's mining yeah, asteroids. <laughs> I know, yeah, there, there are a couple of them. Yeah. I don't, you know. But, you know, I was like, I was like, you know, I, I, keep thinking, I keep thinking they're making this up. But no, no, he's going to mine asteroids. How are you going to do that? The fuel? And I, what, what are you going to get off an asteroid? I don't know if I need that much platinum. I mean, but, but the point is this guy was going to mine asteroids. And I thought, as long as you're doing it with money you earn, blast off. You know, have fun with that. We need people taking those sorts of risks because that's, that's the class of behavior that I think we want to encourage. And, and look, and maybe this is the part of the book that I should have written, but I didn't. Like in the book, I talk about sort of the mental game, like how it, what it's like to get your head into a space where you can actually take those first steps and do something that hasn't been done before. Okay. Well, there's also the financing of that venture. And that financing typically comes from people who are willing to take incredible risk. And they're usually first generation money. Yeah. So your point is the second generation, the money kind of just stays in the bank. And it's not kind of funding lunacy, which in, in, which in reality is, again, this uh, great redistribution of wealth among all the people you're paying with, with the lunacy. They're not going to be lunatics. They're going to be, oh, no, I better just keep it with Wall Street and the banks and my yeah. money manager. And, and so it doesn't really have a chance to kind of escape into the world and, and fund interesting things. And It will only fund things that have been done before. It will only fund the known. Right, like it'll go into a mutual fund, which yeah. will invest in stocks, which will prop up Procter and Gamble or whatever, and yeah. and the world is is as is status. Yeah, I mean, quo. It, conti it continues to go on. Like it's, it's it's a necessary function in the economy, but you also need some crazy. So what's the, what's the solution there? Well, um, what's your solution? I would uh, personally discourage uh, massive generational wealth transfer. And I'm not going to legislate on that. I have to be politically neutral because I'm on the Fed. So I'm not going to sit there and say, well, I'd do this or that. Um, but I would just say that massive generational wealth is, in my mind, not as good as encouraging the generation that made it to roll the, roll the dice. You know? And maybe you can't do that with everybody. But um, I think there's a lot of uh, value in sort of holding up as sort of heroes, these people who do take big risks, either with their money or their time or their reputation, uh, or just, you know, have the guts to do something that might not work. That's tough to do. And, you know, the more we sort of applaud those people, and I see the difference because, you know, I live in St. Louis, Missouri. We're a very conservative town. We don't applaud crazy like we applaud uh, in you know, the place I used to live in San Francisco, like in San Francisco, crazy is a lot more popular. You know, if you failed three times, they'll, you know, they'll still invite you over to dinner. You know, in, in, in St. Louis, we had this very conservative mentality that sort of looks down on you if you fail. And, um, you know, new things fail. Well, and so, and it's interesting because you kind of, I think people overuse the word entrepreneur quite a bit. And there's sort of this entrepreneur porn. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Everybody goes to entrepreneur conferences and blah, blah, blah. But you make this interesting definition. It's not just about starting a business. It has to really be new. And, yeah. and kind of packaged in that is this sort of subcategory of there's 
a lot of new could be idiotic. And you don't, like you said, you don't really know. You don't until, really know. You know, and, and I guess you could take a market and say, well, okay, here's a big market where um, lower, you know, cheaper actors in that market can't, can, can be served in some way. So you mentioned healthcare, there's education, there's cars, uh, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other industries. Uh, so you know that there's a market, but there's so many problems. Like if you think of healthcare, I don't know, it's unclear how you make, you know, expensive drugs cheaper for, you know, patients who can't afford it. It's, it's difficult problems. And so going into that space, you might just drastically fail after a lot of work and time and money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you need a guarantee that you're going to succeed, you can only get that guarantee by copying. Yeah. So well, I thought that was interesting, too, because copying is not a bad business strategy. No, it's a great one. It's the best one. It is a great business strategy. Like if you want to, if you want to just kind of a guarantee that you're going to make a decent amount of money, yep. you could buy up a bunch of laundromats, combine them together, <laughs> take out back office costs, you know, and, and then flip it later. Yes. So, but you did, you were like, nah, I just want to like make sure every business in the world can accept credit cards. <laughs> well, well, I was not interested in doing something that had been done because. Um, it just was uninteresting. But me. this is like true for art too. Like, and I always, we've been debating this quote uh, on the podcast that it's better to be different than better. So you can copy something and be a little bit better, but yeah. no one can really tell. That's brilliant. Like, like, and like if you're like for, I take it, I look at myself as a podcaster. There might be podcasts out there where the podcast is more popular and I feel, oh, I, I'm seeing where he's not quite, or she is not quite doing that well as an interviewer. But it doesn't matter. The average person cannot tell 10% better or 20% better, but they could definitely tell different. Yeah. And so if I have a different kind of guest on, if I'm aiming for different um, outcomes in the interviews, people could tell different. And that's what you did with Square. You weren't like better than another payment processor. You weren't like hitting the same audience as another payment processor, but charging less money. You started off from scratch going into a different audience completely. Yes, different. And and, and you're, you're, you're really right. And that is, Art is the only industry that I know where different is placed as at, at, at the top of, uh, of what's important. Um, and I spent many years making art, you know, making glass. And um, I was never original in my glass. My stuff is very simple. Uh, it's not very original. I, I mean, I make this one bathroom faucet that's original, and that's been selling like crazy. Um, but... Uh, I was struck by the fact that there was this one industry called art where being different is so valued. But then in the rest of the world, no, you want to be derivative. You want yeah. to have a copy. Because a copy can be, it can be known. You can have expertise. You can have a certification. You know, we know how to do that. Great. I'll fund you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that I didn't think of it that way either, that art really is the only place where you have to be different to be known. Like, like, Take Andy Warhol's a great example. Andy Warhol was one of the best illustrators in the ad industry. So he was one of the best illustrators, like actual drawers in the world, but that means nothing in the art world. He, he had to kind of come up with some unique philosophy of art that he could then, you know, create with his art and that would set him apart. So he, was, he started thinking like, oh, maybe he'll do kind of new versions of these classic comic books and make fun of them a little bit. But then he realized his good buddy, Roy Lichtenstein, had just started doing it. So he can't be just better than Roy Lichtenstein because then that would not be, he would, he would be derivative, even if he was better, even if he was 100% better. Yep. He had to do, he had to then take a Campbell soup can and yep. make it art. So it had to be totally different. Yeah, art and entrepreneurship are the two areas where originality is critical. And when I say entrepreneurship, I'm using an archaic definition. I'm using a 150-year-old, 150 150-year-old, the original definition of the word entrepreneur did not mean business person. It meant crazy person. It meant somebody who is doing something weird and different. Um, and, and when I started to write the book, it was funny because I was trying to describe this concept and I realized that I didn't have a word to describe somebody who did something that hadn't been done before in business. And I thought, oh, well, there's got to be a word for this. And I started researching the words and it turns out the word is actually entrepreneur and that's how it was originally used but ever since then we've been applying entrepreneur to everything you know you can be an you know you can make a coffee cup entrepreneur and you can make coffee cups and you know 
the word entrepreneur today has become synonymous with business person. And that's not useful because now we can't section off this weird population of people who are doing things completely differently and discuss them. And so even if you try to have a conversation about entrepreneurship, what, you know, the original definition of entrepreneurship, you can't do it because you start using the word entrepreneur. And I think, you know, Holiday Inn Express, you know, like, oh, I opened a Holiday Inn Express. Well, wait a second, you got a franchise and it's not even a real Holiday Inn. It's like an express, which I guess is this other word that means something different. Express used to mean fast. Now it means like slower and crappier, you know, Um, but you know, like all of a sudden you can't even have a conversation about this because you don't have the word. So um, you know, I apologize to the readers of my book, but like I, I spend the first couple of paragraphs like like redefining a vocabulary so we could have at least this discussion because the concept that I talk about, like if you don't use language precisely, it gets really confusing really fast because most of the stuff that applies to business doesn't apply in the world of entrepreneurship. So, okay, so that's interesting because with entrepreneurship, everybody always uh, equates entrepreneurship with risk taking, which I believe is somewhat true. Certainly took a big risk, like spending a year creating um, the product for Square before we even knew if this was legal or or Visa was going to allow it and so on. So there was a big risk. But I also think there has to be some sense that, okay, you're going to start a business and you're going to immediately start eliminating risk. Like it's sort of like you you have this block of stone that you have and that's that's your risk and now you're just going to keep chipping at it until the final you're removing risk until the final product is developed yes i think risk reduction is the responsibility of the good business person or the good entrepreneur we we all try to minimize risk that's sane behavior but like the business person might um reduce risk by okay i don't want to start my new the my new hotel i'm going to just take the holiday Inn brand which they spent i don't know 100 years building and i'm going to buy one of those and maybe make the, make it a little cleaner than usual. And that's how I'll be a little better. So people stop, stop in mind. So that's how one class removes risk. You removed risk, I guess, by, well, how did you remove risk in Square? Well, we started with uh, a massive amount because we were doing something we didn't know how to do and nobody knew how to do. So that's very risky. But then you just keep working through it. Um, the The difference is that if you're doing a business like a Holiday Inn Express, there is a formula for doing it. You find the land, you get a builder, you get your flag from Holiday Inn. There's a checklist that Holiday Inn literally gives you to be a Holiday Inn Express. Uh, There are uh, companies that will supply the beds and the mattresses, and there's a company that will train your staff. There are reservations. Like every part of that business, you can go to a trade show and find somebody to sell you the part that you need. That ain't the case if you're doing something totally new. In Square's case, the risk looked different. It was this risk that we may never be able to do it. Like we started not knowing that there were any customers for our product. Yeah, not well, knowing I mean, there was customers, not knowing that you were allowed to do it. Yep. And, and then, by the way, not knowing how to do it. Correct. <laughs> yes. Now, off you go. Like that's, that's, that's it. But, and, and, and here's, here's the, the, the thing that I want your listeners to hear. It feels really uncomfortable to do that. I was really uncomfortable doing it. You said you had to drive over on the highway once because I, you were having like a heart attack. I, was having, I thought I was having a heart attack. I was so stressed out that I pulled over to the side of the road and then had my fiance run into like a Walgreens and get some aspirin because I thought like, well, maybe if I'm having a heart attack, like an aspirin will save me. <laughs> I was like, I was that irrational. And was she like, Jim, you're not having a heart attack. You always say this when we drive over 55 miles per hour on the highway. <laughs> Just relax. <laughs> yeah, try using your turn signal instead, you know. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but I, I, it was this, it was this thing. This is not a comfortable way of existing, okay? Um, but, it's necessary if you're going to do something that hasn't been done before. It's just table stakes. And the one thing that I had that was sort of an advantage from my past was I'd done a lot of similar stuff in different industries and you know, at different times of my life. And I learned that just being afraid didn't make me ineffective. And you know, the best example I use from that is sort of a weird one, but I, I I fly planes. I small these fly these small planes, and small planes are terrifying. You know, because you like a big plane flies over the clouds, no problem. Small planes fly through the clouds, and they like the clouds can kill you. They can literally a thunderstorm. We can rip a 
tail off a plane. Um, and uh, it's terrifying. And when I fly small planes, I am terrified. But what I've learned is that I can fly a plane even though I'm terrified. And I can run a business even though I'm terrified. I can run a nonprofit even though I'm terrified. I can do stuff even though I'm uncomfortable. And it's, it's not being brave or anything. Or, I, mean, I shouldn't say this. For me, it's not being brave. I know there are people who are brave. I, I've met some of them and they don't show fear. I show fear. I, I'm often afraid when I do something new. Uh, actually, that's not true. I'm always afraid when I do something new. But that's the price for doing something new in my world. And what I wanted to do was I just wanted to sort of put that in a book and tell people honestly what new feels like and what new looks like. So at least you're still going to be afraid. But if you read about what happened to Square and what happened to these other companies, you might see that it's not an impossible task. It's not something that is necessarily going to kill you. It might. Like it might wipe your business out. You may fail. And that's probably the likely outcome. Statistically, yeah, you're probably going to fail more often than not. But it doesn't have to be that way. And I want people to recognize the signs of success and what success looks like so that they happen to be on that path and they are succeeding. It just hasn't paid off yet. You know, after a year and a half, your product is still not, you know, approved by MasterCard. You know, keep going, you know? Like, why are you going to quit? Well, you may just give up at some point. So if I could get a reader to take an extra step or two, well, that's, that's gold. That, that may give us a new thing in the world that we don't have. Because I guess, you know, the importance of realizing that there is something s such as an innovation stack that, okay, we just solved this problem. So now we have to blank, you know, because this, because we solved this problem, another set of problems were created. So we need another set of solutions and that, you know, goes on and on and on. Like you said, with Southwest, there's 20, 20 steps, but it kind of, there's a psychological component, which means, okay, I don't have to think 20 steps ahead. I just have to think about right now. There's almost like this power of now kind of thing. Oh, yes. Yes. So, you don't and, have to be a genius. Because <laughs> you're not going to be able to predict. No, no. Right. You, you, you know, if you're not smart enough. Don't worry about it. You know, you can you can be kind of a hammer. You don't have to be a scalpel. Right. Yeah. Like, like you, you, you know, you didn't have to sort of think about your customer service be, cost being incredibly low uh, and your volume being incredibly high before you had even developed the product. You kept things simple. What's the first next step? And in a way, that's how you remove the risk. It's like, okay, what's the first, what's the next kind of semi-easy step we could take? We don't have to think about anything else. We just do it, do it well. And in that way, we're removing some risk and kind of we're also removing some stress in the process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of like take the first, take the first step, step, and then, and then duh, you know, like, oh, wait a second, we're 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 solve, you know, we're 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 serving this uh, product to people over the internet. Well, we have to have an online license agreement. Like we can't have 42 pages of six point type, you know, showing up by FedEx in the morning, you know, duh. So we have to solve that, you know, oh, wait a second. Our, our, our customers are small and don't have credit scores. Uh, well, the banks aren't going to accept that. So we have to have our own underwriting, duh, you know, like, uh, and like uh, this stuff is obvious. Like the, the one thing I have to say is that once you commit to doing something new to solve a problem that is unsolved. Like a lot of the decisions are obvious. Like it doesn't take a genius to figure this stuff out. And if you read through what these, you know, world changing companies have done, uh, well, that's kind of obvious. Like, oh, okay, we'll do it that way. What, what irks me is when the obvious thing to do, somebody from the existing industry tells you, well, you can't do that. You know, so we, you know, we had this, um, Ironically, so we came up with this uh, this beautiful license agreement uh, for Square, which is you know our user agreement where you click a button and say, "Yeah, I'll do it." I don't know if you read it. I assume you read it. Maybe not. But look, that's our license agreement. We were told we couldn't do that, and we're like, "Why can't we?" Like, you, like I didn't read the forty two page contract I signed either. Like I might not read the license, but like you're telling me that there's no way that I can get a click license agreement, which you, you see thousands of these things in a year. And you're telling me they're, none of them are legally binding? You're telling me that whole thing? No, we, we can solve that. We can figure it out. It's just the banking system isn't used to that. So we have to beat on the banking system a little bit. But eventually you punch the right bank, they go, ah, oh, sure, you know? And those are solvable problems. 
but you can't um, you can't quit just because you know the first banker you talk to goes well you can't do it that way. No, I just say okay, you can't do it that way. Ironically, ironically, I love this. The same guy from the payment system of payments industry who told me I was an idiot, took me out to dinner, called me an idiot for two hours. Later, copied Square's product and copied our license agreement so directly that they literally downloaded it, did a find and replace, like in Microsoft Word, they just took out Square and put the name of his company um, and just used that as their license agreement to the comma. Like it was so, we actually sued him over it because it was like theft of our license agreement. Um, that was hilarious. But yeah. Did they, they didn't succeed at all, I'm assuming? No, they got wiped out. Because <laughs> it seems like also this is one of those industries where it's like all or nothing. Like there's not going to be like 25 squares in the industry. So typically with innovation stack companies, it's all or nothing. You typically, if you create a market, you typically have that market to yourself until you become so greedy or lazy that you just let others slowly take it from you. Now, but what, you can go for years. What happens like... Where, where where do you see like uh, Bitcoin in the future? So you're kind of Square is very interesting because it's this as we sort of race towards this cashless society, and now everybody can accept credit cards because of Square. The next step is well, what about digital currencies? Do you see kind of Bitcoin playing a role in transactions anytime soon? Bitcoin is super important. Cryptocurrency in general is super important. Any transfer of value is super important. And what Bitcoin's been able to do, um, blockchain and specifically, is uh, sort of anonymize, quasi-anonymize. It's not fully anonymous, but we quasi-anonymize those transactions. Um, it's a really wonderful technology. Um, uh, Jack and I have a lot of diff- disagreements on this. So you get Jack on this, uh, you know, he'd, he'd tell you why he likes it. Um, and, uh, you know, so full disclosure, I'm a, a deputy chairman of the St. Louis Fed. Okay, which means I sit as both a, uh, as, as it was you know, somewhat of a regulatory response. And I believe that um, anonymous payment has some real dangers for society. So I'm concerned as somebody who has to, you know, sort of watch um, at, at, at a higher level. Um, and you look, at a, you look at a society like Sweden that eliminated cash, uh, crime went down because if I stole your bike, I couldn't fence it. Well, they figured out that they can now fence it in euros. So crime has returned to Sweden. It's just all done in euros now. It's not done in kroner. Um, but as far as crypto goes, I think there are two sort of big unknowns, and that is how the uh, governments of the world are going to respond. Because governments fundamentally don't like anonymous transactions. They just don't like it. Um, and my guess is that when the governments come in, it will probably not, not be the Western governments. It'll be the more um, uh, efficient totalitarian governments. And I think that's going to be really interesting to see how that happens. Or, or like, what about a case of something like in Argentina where their currency is so insane at the moment, the yeah. government may or may not be corrupt, who knows? And then so the, the, the people just suddenly say, look, we need to have transactions. We don't trust our own currency. Bitcoin's our only choice. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a great solution for that um, because they were transacting in dollars and then they had all these cash problems. You know, they were literally having... Right. They have a supply and demand co- problem because you actually need the physical cash. They had a crime problem. They, like, they would make any, uh, uh, y- you know, any drug dealer, uh, uh, you know, sympathetic because they were literally toting... Like, normal businesses were toting around, you know, cases of cash. Uh, and the banks wouldn't take them because they didn't... Oh, it was a disaster. So, yeah, crypto's great, you know. Um, it's a solution to a lot of problems. So now, as as a deputy Fed chairman, you probably see a lot of data. What's uh, uh, what's the chances of a recession? What does a recession start? You know, and you know, Square Square just started right when the financial crisis ended. So you kind of had this like nice, you know, upward motion in the economy for the past ten years. What what can we look forward to next? So I am not able to speak as a. We're not going to tell Fed chairman. Yeah, so I'll ignore those cameras and these two giant microphones, and 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 just say that. Did you give him our agreement? Yeah. We have a simple forty-two page agreement. <laughs> like this. <time. laughs> no, I, I I will say this. Um, I've 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 you know, been on the Fed for two years. Um, I've listened to some of the brightest economists in the world opine on this, and what I will tell you is that we think the economy is in a pretty good place, but it is in a new place. Okay, so it's always different. And one of the things that sort of amazed me when I came to the Fed was just how confusing some of the stuff is. Like we've been doing some things uh, that 
haven't been done before. I mean, ever since 2008, you know, the, uh, the fiscal crisis, uh, there've been things like quantitative easing, you know, QE would build up this huge balance sheet. Well, nobody knew what that was going to do. Well, it turned out it went, went pretty well. And then, you know, we started letting it roll off and that went really well and it went really well because nobody talked about it. And now, so now you ask me the question. So I guess, I guess this is it. Like, this is probably the conversation that will tank the economy. Like it'll happen on your show and I'll have to resign and this is it, you know? So you heard it here first, but, but you know, it's at some point there's going to be some sort of panic and the markets will respond as they always do in panics. Is there occasional panic? But, um, I will say from having looked at the data for two years in, in pretty good detail, detail, things look pretty good. Things are running, you know? Is there ever a danger? Like, you know, let's say, uh, and I'm, I'm asking this completely naively. Yeah. Like, okay, there's been some deregulation of smaller banks. There's also been sort of tax repatriation of some companies that had uh, cash overseas. There's also, you know, the Fed maybe is, you could argue whether it's not as aggressive as it should be or or whatever. So this it seems like there's a kind of odd form of continued quanti- quantitative easing, albeit a little more artificially. So there's there's money being kind of dropped onto the economy keeping things flush, but is there ever a danger point? Now, there wasn't when there was a trillion dollar bailout, but at what point is it too much money being dropped onto the economy? So the, the, the answer, and I can only answer for myself, I'm not speaking for the Federal Reserve. I, I'm not qualified to speak for the Federal Reserve. I'm honestly not even qualified to speak for myself in a lot of cases. But my personal opinion is that um, from what I've witnessed at the Fed, there are really, really smart, caring people who are apolitical, who try to solve these questions, and they have open debates about it, and there are no clear answers. Mm. Um, and when you're doing something new, like quantitative easing, uh, you are in new territory. And uh, It's funny how there's an innovation stack there. Let's, there there let, is an innovation let's stack. Let's bail out the banks. Oh, so then we have to now bail out the insurance companies. Yeah. So then we have to now figure out how to encourage the banks to keep cash in the banks rather than lend it out on yeah. subprime stuff or whatever. Yeah. But thank God they didn't do what they did in the in, in the depression, which was say we can't do that. You know the central bank in the well, what the central banks don't do that. Well, these guys innovated and they probably saved our economy, you know, and they definitely did a lot of things right. And you say, oh, well, you made some mistakes. Look, that's hindsight. Um, these guys are very, very thoughtful, and um, the folks that I work with at the Fed are 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 brilliant and and they're independent. The other thing is they're an a political institution. So I'm politically neutral. I don't back any either side. Um, I listen to both sides. Um, and every everybody at the Fed maintains this, this independence. And that independence is so important because uh, monetary policy is so easy to politicize. You know, every uh, congressman or president would would love to take control of the uh, uh, of the monetary policy to manipulate the economy. And you could do that short term, but Long term, it has really bad effects. And we look at the independent central banks in the world, and they're successful. And the ones who are not are disasters. Mm. So uh, you have a new company, Invisibly. You wanna? I don't. I couldn't figure out actually, other than the kind of slogans on the website, like what it does. So Invisibly is an attempt to, and I say attempt because I again I don't know if it's going to work. Um, an attempt to uh, do two things for every person to give them control over, over how their eyeballs are bought and sold, and to give them a voice in the content that's created for them. So I'll give you the two simple examples of that. Right now, you have files you have, that sit in Facebook servers and Google servers and 100 different ad tech companies that you've never heard of, um, and they represent you. Uh, but you don't know them. You don't know what's in them. You don't know who's controlling it. You don't know how you are being monetized. You don't know how you, as an, as an entity, are represented. And I think that's wrong. I think you should have control and you should have, it. You should have authority over how your identity is bought and sold. So that's thing one. Oh, and so related to that, yeah. with Square, do you ever do the data? You, you guys actually know everything people buy. Yep. So what, do you do, do anything with that data? No, we don't sell it. We don't sell it. No, we don't do that. Um, it's interestingly enough, because I, you know, I said on the Fed, and the Square has wonderful real-time data uh, that the Fed would love to have to see how the economy is doing. And it's probably one of the reasons I was invited to join the Fed. Um, and I tried to get Square to uh, you know, aggregate, you know, no individual data, just, yeah, just aggregate data. 
and um, we still haven't been able to work that out. Mm. They are so protective of data at Square that they won't even share it with the governing monetary, you know, with the, with the, with the national, you know, with the, with the bank of the United States, you know, the, the central bank of the United States doesn't have access to it. Uh, we're very protective of that. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, what was the other question? So, yeah. so just, uh, so back to the, the fed, you see all this data, um, and you know, you see the economy seems to be going pretty well. You square, you don't, sell the data, but you probably have uh, access to that as well. Um, I don't know. I was just making some point about data. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh so and, I was, and you asked me about Invisibly and I uh, the second point. So one is you have a file that represents you. You have, you have a bunch of them. This should be under, under your control. You should have control. The second thing is you should, as a consumer, be able to pay more for good stuff and less for bad stuff. Okay, so let's talk about this podcast. Okay, like there are four people in the room working on this podcast right now. Okay. At some point, they have to be paid. This podcast has to make money. So to create quality content, because we're going to have to edit this, um, you're going to have to do work. And we want to pay for that work. Right now, the model that pays for most of the content we put in our brains is the following. Uh, it's either subscription or advertisement or pay-per-view. Pay-per-view has basically never worked online, so forget pay-per-view. We're left with subscriptions and ads. Subscriptions. Uh, only five English language publications actually make money on subscriptions. New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and The Economist. If it's not one of those fives, you're getting your money from advertising. So here's the problem with advertising. It is, at least online, proportional to the amount of time you hold a user's attention, which means if I create 20 seconds of content that you love, I get the same money for that as if I create 20 seconds of crap after 20 seconds, you just discover that it's crap and you click away. I can monetize those roughly the same amount. Mm. And that's a disaster because that's like saying to the world, hey, look, we're going to say that every restaurant in Manhattan charges 10 bucks for a meal. And you say, oh, cool. I'll go to a really nice restaurant tonight. No, you won't because it's closed because they can't put food on the table for 10 bucks. So the dominant economic model for online content is this programmatic ad ecosystem that delivers these you know, uh, generic ad units that are priced per second. And your eyeballs are so appallingly cheap that what happens is you lose your voice. And what I mean by you lose your voice is you don't get to pay more for good stuff and less for bad stuff. And I know this is really theoretical and I want to- No, no, it's, uh, it's an issue we yeah. deal with every day. Yeah, I mean, so, so think about this. I want to pay a lot of money for good things because that is my signal to the economy, go out and make more things like this, okay? And I want to pay less money for crap because that is my signal to the economy, don't make these things. That signal works everywhere except online. You make something that's crap, you get paid for the moments I look at it. And if you trick me or... You're you're not you're not rewarded for creating quality. So I, I was with. Um, but, but but you're you're yeah. you are punished for creating something that's not quality because you lose brand value and so you won't get the return customer. Yeah yeah. I mean there is there is that sort of you know you're trying to build a brand and you're trying and then you try to d defend the brand. Um, but there are a lot of uh, you know there are a lot of edge cases. Okay. So what if you only have one good brand in you? So I'm writing a book. This is probably gonna be my last book. This thing was torture writing. Like it took me three years. Okay. By the way, it's, right, it, you, it's good writing it. You tell stories. It's, it's, it's good. It's not just like a lecture. It's good rewriting. That's <laughs> well. That's well, all writing is. Well, good yeah, rewriting. you're looking. You're looking at three years. That's that's draft number eight you have in your hand. Like, look, like, chapter one starts. Your first line in the book before stalking got such a bad <laughs> reputation. I was pretty good at it. That's a great first line for a business book. Thank you. That's a masterful line. Thank you. I, you know, right. I never, I, I, the first, the first second I'm reading something. Oh, okay. This is going to be a well-written book. Oh, thank you. You know, right when you're sleep deprived, it helps, <laughs> uh, it, it helps do stuff like that. Like it was excruciating for me to do that. So that's a one-off. So I'm not going to build a brand as an author. You know, I'm not going to have, you know, 12 follow on books. Um, so what if I've created something really good? Shouldn't I make money from that really good thing? So imagine somebody who creates a piece of content or just like 
say you create a great video and it's 10 minutes long and you say, boy, it's great. But if I really work on it, if I really polish this thing up, I can cut it down to five minutes. Well, there's no incentive for you to do that. But five minutes of the same content delivered more succinctly is hugely valuable to me as a user. Like I'll pay you four times as much for something that's half as long. There's no economic incentive to do that. There's no economic incentive for quality. Now you can build brand, yeah, and that's, but that's kind of subscription. See, subscription is the brand that is so valuable. I say, well, I can't live without your show, so I'm going to subscribe. Or I can't live without your magazine, so I'm going to subscribe. But let me tell you, you're not going to subscribe to everything. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna stall out. And you know, I spend a lot of time with media executives, and I ask them, you know, how many subscriptions do you personally have? I've never heard more than eight. You know, they got Netflix and kind of Hulu and oh, maybe they'll get Disney Plus now. And then, you know, New York Times Financial, like blah, 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 blah. Never get more than eight. And these are for people who live in the media world. Hmm. So, so, so this is what Invisibly is trying to fix. How do you fix it? Oh, God. Um, so what we do is we partner with all the media companies and we uh, implement a micropayment system that's invisible. So you don't have to know that it works. But basically, we pay you for watching ads. So if you want to watch an ad, uh, it, so, it, so, so first of all, this whole thing works without anybody ever having to do anything because we realize most of our, you know, they've legalized marijuana everywhere. So, uh, like we assume that most of our users are just like stoned and just don't high, care. just watching just, podcasts. Yes. Just dumb. <laughs> just, 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 just food being com- delivered by Grubhub. That's right. <laughs> they, 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 like hooked up to an IV tube and a catheter <laughs> and, and, a, and the dispensary, you know, <laughs> like a pong. And I, <laughs> they're in a VR simulation <laughs> all day. <laughs> That's right. The glasses. That's even perfect. <laughs> and now I have the perfect vision of my user. Right. <laughs> um, look, um, nobody cares about this stuff. I mean, they say they care, but they're not going to do anything differently. What invisibly does is it, uh, essentially takes over the vending of advertising and the payment for consuming content automatically and invisibly until you care to see what your eyeballs are being bought and sold for. So at some point, I'm going to give you a screen and you're going to maybe click it. Maybe you won't. If you don't click it, the same thing that's always happened is going to happen. You're going to see ads, except that you don't know that you're being actually paid into a bank account for that ad. And you don't know that out of that invisible bank account, I'm actually paying for the content that you read or watch. Mm. So that's all happening invisibly. But if you want to take control, you can take control and I'll say, okay, James, here's what your eyeballs sold for. Here's all the ads that I've showed you. Here's what you were paid for those ads. And you go, like, you're advertising a bunch of products that I don't care about. Like, you're, you're advertising stuff that I've already bought. You, like, I don't, and, and you say, this is stupid, Jim. I want to tell you the products that I'm actually interested in. Oh, and by the way, Quit targeting my kids because it pisses me off that you're advertising, you know, you should have agency over that. And if you choose to, you should have the ability to opt out completely because guess what? Your eyeballs are worth like fractions of a cent per second. Like it's, it's, if I told you how cheap your attention was, like you would, you would like probably throw that water bottle at me. Like it's, it's appallingly cheap. So, um. I feel like, Particularly when I'm on a Twitter debate yeah. and, <laughs> and there's advertisements like every time, no, I meant this and more advertisements, <laughs> my elbows yeah. worth nothing then. Oh my God. So, uh, so we think you should be able to opt out as well. Mm-hmm. Like if you want to completely opt out of ads and pay for your value some other way, um, do it. Uh, or if you wanted to sit there and say, Hey, look, uh, I know that I'm worth a hundred times as much if I tell you a product that I'm about to buy or that I'm interested in. Well, you actually are worth a hundred times as much. Um, I'll show you one ad of that, and then you'll get rid of a hundred other little ads. So it seems like, like forgetting crypto for a second, but just yeah. the technology behind blockchain. It seems like that's a good way to sort of keep control of my privacy and 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 know directly who has access to it. Yes, if everyone sort of subscribes to the system. Yeah, if we can get so so. Uh, unfortunately, the problem is if everyone. Like when you say if everyone, mm-hmm. a lot of these uh, systems have tipping points where you have to have, you know, super massive adoption before it actually works. So what we're doing it invisibly is we're spinning this up in a, in a way that doesn't require mass adoption to start. Mm-hmm. And look, I don't know if it's going to work. I, I, I tell you, I'm eating my own dog food here. It's an innovation stack. We are, we are, we are failing. We, so we've been at it for three years. We vaporized 20 million plus dollars. I don't have a working product yet. I got a great team. Uh, I'm supposed to 
go have dinner with them, you know, tonight. Uh, we we think we're close. <laughs> we're trying to like, but it, it it's the same thing I talk about in the book. It's like we're we are in an iterative process of solving one problem, new problem, solving one problem, new, problem, and it does not work yet, and it may never. But well, I'm I'm going. I think I think again this model of the innovation stack made me look back over the past thirty years of different small businesses I've started and and realize where I messed up by not kind of subscribing to this philosophy. Like I think this I wish I had read this 30 years ago. Why didn't you call me at least and tell me this idea? There's so and then also again the the idea of seeking out the the, the new underserved market was is very is is very good. And um those two together I wish I'd had this. I wish I'd had this. I, 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 that's why I wrote it. I mean, the whole, the, you know, right. Cause when you put it to words, sometimes it helps you understand when, when I finally saw the pattern, which I describe in the book, I was like, Holy shit. I got to write. Like I had to write this book. I literally had to, I could not not write this thing because like, you know what it's like, you know, you tell me 30 years. I sent this. I sent this book to my friend Pete Kins. He had a he had a very very successful company. He's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, Pete was like, "How come I didn't have this when I was twenty? Like what?" And, and I was like, "I know. Like like you see this pattern. You want to share it because look, it's good for the world to have people fixing stuff." I I say this book was comparable for, for me to um you know a book from I guess now it's like almost six years ago. Zero Peter Thiel zero, zero to, to one, one. Yeah. where I didn't really. He has such a like a unique way of looking at how you know sort of turning capitalism upside down and seeing what everybody else has missed. Yeah, and uh, and it was the same kind of feeling here. Like, oh, okay, this is how this situation, this is how entrepreneurship works. And uh, I had a similar type of feeling that uh, as that book. That is a great compliment because I'm a huge fan of Peter. So Peter's backing invisibly. So Peter's my VC. Huh, I, right? I didn't know that. Um, and I'll tell you why. I Peter, I I chose Peter of of all the VCs. He was he was the number one choice, and it was because this is a guy who understands what it is to back something that might not work, but if it does work, changes the world. Hmm. And we had a phenomenal conversation because during the pitch with Peter, you know, we we ran through all the pitch, we showed him all this stuff, and I said, by the way, I don't know if it's going to work. Like micropayments have never worked so in the history of the internet, and you know, I ran through all the logic, and uh, he says, well, that's great, Jim, but. Um, we never invest in media companies. And this is a media play. So I don't think we can help you. And I said, Peter, ask yourself why you don't invest in media. There's like 20 seconds of silence. And he said, oh, I guess I'm coming to St. Louis now. <laughs> and, 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 and the conclusion was, look, the reason he doesn't invest in media companies is exactly what Invisibly is trying to solve. Now, I'm not saying we're going to do it, okay? I get to vaporize all of Peter's money, and then I don't get to go to his, you know, he has great parties, you know. Uh, we went to uh, his Christmas party in 2018. Yeah. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's a cool guy. Uh, I got an autographed edition of, of Zero to One uh, in, my, in my bookcase. It's cherished, and, and I, I, he gave me a blurb for the book. Peter gave me a blurb. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't think okay. it's in, I don't think <laughs> in the copy you have, but uh, Peter gave me a blurb. But- yeah, it's great. And, and, and when you read Zero One, you think, oh, yeah, I kind of knew that. I kind of saw that, but I didn't have the clarity of it. So. Right. Again, when it's put to words, like when, the word, when you describe the innovation stack, not only for Square, but all these other companies, now it makes sense. Now you know what to lo- look out for in your own business, whether it's a big business, a small business, a podcast, even a book, because a, a book has to follow. Okay, so we... M- murdered someone in the first chapter, so now we have to find yeah. a murderer and uh, and so on. So it applies to like a lot of creativity, and again, also the idea of uh, you know being different, f- finding that completely huge underserved, usually low hanging you know market is is inc- very interesting. Yeah, you know, it's like I, I, if you've ever played an instrument without knowing music theory, like you can play the guitar and just grab a guitar and start learning chords. But if you actually learn how music theory works, you, you say, oh, wow, that's a fifth and that's a minor chord. And yeah, like it helps to know some of the theory. Unfortunately, with this stuff, um, we haven't had good discussions because, because we didn't have the words. 
Hmm. Because the word entrepreneur has come to mean every business, not just the new weird ones. Well, uh, Jim McElvey, uh, founder, co-founder of Square, author of the Innovation Stack, and the subtitle is "Beating an Unbeatable Build, uh, Beating Building an Unbeatable Business One Crazy Idea at a Time." This is a great book. Thank you for such an interesting conversation. Uh, I, I'm gonna well, at, when the cameras are when the mics are off, I'm gonna ask you all about the Federal Reserve. Cool. And uh, uh, thanks so much. What a pleasure.